So we were, uh, we wanted to finish group theory today. We were talking about uh, the silo theorems and uh, the only thing that was missing was uh, the, uh, the proof of the third silo theorem. Ah, so I'm supposed to. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, so we had, to, so the third silo theorem said uh, the following. So if, um, again, we have that, we have a group such that the number of elements is uh, n, which is equal to p to the m times r. And we assume, as usual, that uh, p does not divide r. Um, <coughs> so then, so we look at, we want to know how many uh, uh, p silo subgroups are there. And so the statement is if let S be the number of P silo subgroups, um, then uh, we have first that S divides R. I will now kind of always use this notation for divides. You know? And um, S is congruent 1 modulo P. So if you divide S uh, by P, the rest is 1. So we don't precisely know what the number of P0 subgroups is, but we get some good estimate we have seen in some of the applications that this sometimes uh, when numbers are not too big, for instance, allows you to conclude that the number of p pseudo subgroups is indeed one. We had some cases where this was the case. Okay. So now we want to come to the proof. So we had um, a corollary to so proof. So a corollary to the uh, second silo theorem told us that all p silo subgroups are conjugated. All silo subgroups are conjugated. Now you remember this, the, the statement was much more precise, conjugated anyway. So I maybe write it in such a way that you can actually read it, although. So they are conjugated to each other. So they, I can say they are conjugated to one given one, to uh, one P pseudo subgroup. which I call H. So I've kind of picked out one. So, <clears throat> um, so we have by the, so we, you know, we have that G acts on uh, these, uh, so, <clears throat> G acts on these uh, P pseudo subgroups by conjugation. So, um, so by the, and the stabilizer under this conjugation action of H is the normalizer of H. So that means that uh, the, um, the number of pseudo subgroups, which is just the, the number of elements in the orbit of H, so it means that S 
is equal to the number of elements in the orbit of H is therefore equal to the index by the orbit stabilizer theorem to the index of uh, NH in G. Now, NH is a subgroup of G, and uh, H is a subgroup of NH. So, H is a subgroup of NH, and NH is a subgroup of G. So, uh, therefore, we find um, that, uh, you know, that the index of NH in G, which is our number S, divides the index of uh, G in H. Namely, uh, by an exercise we know that um, uh, we just have that this number, the index of G in H, is just a product of this and the index of NH in G, uh, in, of H in NH. So, you know, this was an old exercise in the first session that uh, GH is equal to G NH times NH H. Oh. Well, <coughs> and so uh, that's it because um, the index of the P pseudo subgroup is precisely R you know, because the group H has P to the M elements. So this uh, proves uh, the first statement. So this first statement is basically obvious. Now we have to show that S is congruent to 1 modulo P. It's also not very difficult. So we look at this set. So we. So first we look at the set H1 to HS is a set of P0 subgroups. Now, we know that G acts on it by conjugation. No? And um, the subgroup, if I take a subgroup of G, it also acts on it by conjugation, so I can take H to act on, you know, also the subgroup H of G acts on this set of by conjugation. So G acts on this set by conjugation. And therefore, also H. So we can decompose um, this set into orbits for the action of H. We know that if we take the action of G, there's only one orbit because they are all conjugate. But to H is a subgroup, so there might be more. Um, and um, I will, so these are, we know that, so one of these uh, pseudo subgroups is after all the group we chose. So the first one we call H. No? We have H was one of our P pseudo subgroups. So, <coughs> Um, so, 
we have this. <coughs> so we want to know how many, you know, we, we want to see that S is congruent to 1 mod P. So we, we want to see that, uh, basically we want to see that there's one orbit which has one element and all the other orbits have, it, have a number of elements divisible by P. So we can look at the orbit of H. So obviously, um, so the orbit, well, first say the orbit of, uh, do I really? Yeah. Of uh, HI consists only of the element HI itself, so only of one element, if and only if uh, H is contained in the normalizer of HI. No? The normalizer of HI are all the elements such that if I conjugate with it, I get back HI. So, and you know, we want to, we look at the conjugation with uh, elements in H, so this won't do anything to HI if and only if H is contained in, a, in the normalizer of HI. So now <coughs> we can, so in this case, I say that both H and HI are pseudo subgroups of the normalizer of HI, because the normalizer of HI is a, you know, is a <coughs> is a subgroup of G. So um, the maximal power of P that divides the number of elements can be at most this M, but H is contained at it, so it is M. So the P pseudo subgroup of it will have P to the M will be this H. There cannot be a bigger uh, P group inside N of HI because, you know, it must be contained in G, the number of elements. So maybe the number of elements of the number of elements in, in, in N of HI divides uh, the number of elements in G because it's a subgroup of G, so thus, um, which is equal to P to the M times R. So it follows that uh, the largest power of P, which con can con be contained in this, is P to the M. On the other hand, we do have a subgroup of order P to the M contained in it, you know, because H is, uh, <coughs> in, under our assumptions, H is contained in it. So, therefore, this is the P0 subgroup. But if this is the case, so HI, by, by definition of the normalizer, HI is a normal subgroup of, uh, of N of HI. No, because the, you know, N of HI is just all the, uh, so just if you look at definition, it's a normal subgroup. So <clears throat> all the P0 subgroups of um, uh, N of HI are conjugate to each other in this N of HI. So, and, uh, but this one is a normal subgroup, so it means all P0 subgroups are equal to this one. So it means HI is equal to H. Are conjugate now in N of HI, it follows that, uh, you know, 
as it's a normal subgroup, it cannot be conjugated to anything else than itself. It follows that H is equal to HI. So under the assumption that uh, the orbit of HI consists only of HI, we find that HI must be equal to H. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at H, obviously the orbit under conjugation by H of H is also H itself. So we find there's precisely one orbit which has only one element. So thus, the orbit of H is the only one with only one element. And now we will want to, you know, <clears throat> so by the orbit stabilizer theorem, so if we have any, uh, for any other, for any other HI, um, by the orbit stabilizer theorem, we have that the number of elements in the orbit is a divisor of the number of elements in the group that acts, which is H. So the number of elements in the orbit, so under the so H acts on this. The number of elements which lie in the orbit under conjugation of H on this, so number of elements in the orbit, so the number of elements in the orbit is a divisor of the number of elements in H, which is P to the M. So, and it's a divisor which is not one because we know that the only case when uh, the number of elements in the orbit is one is when this uh, pseudo subgroup is H itself. So, it follows thus the number of elements in the orbit is divisible by P. No, and it's not one. It's different from one. Okay, and so thus this number is divisible by P. So we find we can decompose this set H1 to HS into disjoint subsets, namely the orbits. So thus um, uh, each, so, so this thing, H1 to HS, is a disjoint union of orbits uh, so such that one of them has uh, one element and the order of all others is divisible by P. have a number of elements divisible by P. So it follows that uh, the number S, you know, the number of elements here, the number S leaves rest one if one divides by P. Thus, S is congruent to 1 mod P. So it's not, uh, <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that is it. So it's not, this one is uh, in some sense uh, 
is not so difficult, but it's maybe slightly tricky to take this action by H. But in some sense, we just used the standard uh, results, the orbit stabilizer theorem, a few times, and there was nothing really uh, fancy going on. And maybe kind of using that, uh, you know, if you have a normal subgroup, uh, then uh, um, it's uh, fixed by the conjugation and uh, whatever. <coughs> Okay, so maybe that's now it for the uh, for the silo uh, theorems. Are there questions about this? So I should say that uh, you are looking. <laughs> anyway, um, so I mean, I can also, if it's not clear, I can also repeat some part. But in some sense, you know, it's really an elementary argument. It's only a bit more complicated than we, what we had in the beginning. So the silo theorems was, were certainly the most uh, complicated part of the group theory. I mean, mostly because we somehow put everything together that we learned until now and kind of expected to be able to use it freely without kind of, okay. So maybe that's now <coughs> enough. If there are no further questions, I will start with rings. So basically, um, in this group theory, there was a certain acceleration. It got slightly more difficult towards the end. And with the rings, we start again by zero, and it again starts quite easily. And we just give the basic definitions of rings and the first properties. So, So basically, <coughs> you know, from school you kind of know the integers and you kind of uh, know that you can add them and you can multiply them and you can uh, also take, you have a, a neutral element for the addition and uh, additive inverse in the integers. But you don't always, you don't necessarily have a multiplicative inverse of every element. So a ring is something which uh, kind of has this property that you have a, uh, some set where you have an addition and multiplication, and the addition forms a group, and the multiplication at least is a little bit comp compatible with the, with the addition. And uh, so that uh, some of the properties that you're used to from the integers still hold, most of them. So let's just give the definition. So a ring is a non-empty set R. Together with two binary operations. Operations, so this just means maps from R times R to R. So plus from R times R to R, AB is sent to A plus B. And times from R times R to R, AB is sent to A times B, such that with the addition, R is a commutative group. So also we have a distinguished element and an element, C zero in R, such that if I take R together with the addition, this is a commutative group. like the integers with addition, with uh, neutral element 0. And we will always, uh, you know, for this additive group, we use the additive notation. So the inverse of an element is minus a and so on. 
this is the first thing and then we have this operation and it should be somewhat compatible and this is reflected uh, first the multiplication should be associative and second it should be compatible with the addition which means there's a distributive law so such that uh, maybe so this is the first statement the second is uh, we have the multiplication is associative so that means for all a b c in r we have uh, a i mean write this we have that if i take a times b times c this is the same as if i do it in the other order and we have this compatibility between addition and multiplication which is the distributive laws namely we have a times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c and uh, say uh, say b plus c times a is equal to uh, b times a plus c times a so i don't here for the moment i do not assume that the multiplication is commutative so this is it and so this is the definition of a ring i do not require that i get a group with the multiplication and i do not require that the multiplication is commutative but we have these laws and i call r with just the operation plus i call is called the additive group the additive group of r and i call zero um, one can also call the zero element zero element of r and i will as usual um, from now on i don't you know i can also just not write the dot for multiplication as i did also for the multiplication in groups okay and the, obviously the typical example is that um, uh, if i take z together with the usual multiplication addition and the usual multiplication this is the ring and uh, the zero is is the zero of r maybe i don't need that now so uh, now that we have rings we can define subrings so uh, like with groups if you have a ring and you have a subset of a ring it's called a subring if uh, by restricting the operations to this subset you again get a ring so practically that means uh, so to check it this means definition Um, let R be a ring and uh, let A subset R be a subset um, it is a subring of R if uh, by definition if the following holds first we have that if i take uh, a plus so a is a subgroup of the group r with the addition now we know how one checks for a subset to be a subgroup for instance for every element 
A in A minus the element is contained on for any two elements, A B in A, A plus B is contained. And um, the second is that it is closed under multiplication. So for all A, B, and A, we have that A times B is an element in A. And then obviously by definition, if I take A and give it the restriction of the addition on R and the restriction of the multiplication to A, this is again a ring. So a typical example, a simple example, is, uh, for instance, 2z, which we had before, set of all 2n, such that n is in z, is a subring. Of c. So we will later restrict attention to commutative rings. So what does it mean for a ring to be commutative? We have assumed in the definition of a ring that the addition is always commutative. So the ring is commutative if the multiplication is also commutative. A ring R is called commutative if uh, the multiplication is commutative. So if A times B is equal to B times A for all A, B in R. As I said, the addition is anyway commutative. We also, uh, so for instance, the, uh, the integers are commutative ring. Because multiplication is commutative. In the, in, in the integers, we also have a, a neutral element for the multiplication. If you multiply anything by one, we get back the element. So this would be, such an element is called a unit element. So definition. Um, an element one, I, I, I note it by one, but I mean, some, in some cases it would be not the number one, but just something called one, which is an, an element R, which is different from zero. So we require this element to be not the zero element, is called a unit element. So one, in, in a moment, we will also talk about something which is called a unit. That's something different. So a unit element is the element one. It's called a unit element if it's the neutral element of multiplication. So if for all elements A and R, we have one times A is equal to A times one is equal to A. And such an element does not always end uh, so it's easy to check. I mean, you can do it. It's like for it's an easy exercise to see that um, uh, in this case, if such an element exists, it is unique. You can check that. And if contains, if, if R does contain such a unit element, one calls it a um, uh, a unital ring or a ring with one. So I'm only telling you definitions, so nothing at all is happening. You only, there are all these words which eventually you will have to, to master, but obviously I have not done anything. So if R contains a unit element uh, 
and then it's called a unitard ring. Or a ring with one. I usually just use that. Or a ring with one. So um, we can see that, for instance, the integers z contain an, a, a, a unit element, namely the one in z. And uh, 2z does not contain uh, a unit element because, uh, you know, uh, Whatever you multiply any element here with, you always get something different. So later we will mostly be interested in uh, commutative rings with one. Okay, this is kind of trivial. So let's look at. Um, at least one case of a non-commutative ring. Example. So we can look at, uh, say, so that R be the, is the real numbers. And we look at, uh, say, M 2 times 2 of R, which is the set of all 2 times 2 matrices with coefficients, with entries in R. In the real numbers. So the elements look like A equal to A, B, C, D, where A, B, C, D are real numbers. And I claim this is a ring. So the addition, uh, so the, the addition in the ring is just the component-wise addition, as usual. So A, B, C, D plus A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime is, as usual, A plus A prime, B plus B prime, C plus C prime, D plus D prime. So you just add them as vectors. And uh, the neutral element for the addition obviously is uh, zero. So zero element is the matrix where all entries are zero. And um, the multiplication in the ring, you take the matrix multiplication. Maybe I don't. So multiplication equal to the matrix multiplication, like you learn maybe in high school or in the first semester. So if I would do it for the same thing. You would have, uh, for multiplying the same things with each other, you get A times A prime plus uh, B times C prime. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, A times B prime plus B times D prime. And then you have here uh, C times A prime plus D times C prime. And um, <coughs> uh, C times B prime plus D times D prime. OK, so the usual multiplication. And uh, as usual, this is actually a ring with 1. So m2 two times 2r two is a unitary ring. And uh, the unit element is, uh, you know, the 
identity matrix with unit element the standard identity matrix. Okay. And uh, maybe I can also come back to these uh, integers modulo k. I want to use them. What's another example? So if I if k is a positive integer, I had introduced the set. Uh, so z k was supposed to be the integers. modulo k. So this is just as a set, it's just a set 0, 1 to k minus 1, as we had before. We had defined the addition by saying that in this group we have, a, you know, for the moment I write the addition differently, n plus m is just we take uh, the sum n plus m and then we take the rest after division by k. And we can, in the same way, multiply, use, define also the multiplication, namely the product of n times m. It's just we take the product of these two numbers in the integers, and we divide by k and take the rest. And you uh, can check that this is, again, a ring. A commutative ring. because the multiplication in the integers is commutative, obviously, ring with 1. So the 0 element is element 0, and the unit element is element 1. Anyway, this is quite standard, and uh, I think this you might also have learned in high school. Okay. <coughs> or at least... Uh, we had it uh, for the addition, it works the same way for the multiplication. So we make some trivial remarks that um, you know, some of the obvious rules of, uh, uh, that you have when you work with the integers also hold in any ring. So it's just for instance, in the integers you know if you multiply anything by 0, then you will get 0. And this also holds an n ring. Then if you multiply anything by minus something else, you get minus uh, something else. So minus a times b is equal to uh, a times minus b is equal to minus a times b. And uh, also, say, um, if you take, do this twice, you get this. And um, if you multi multiply, so if R is a ring with 1, so, so R is a ring, so let R be a ring. And now I'm above the line, but it's not. Uh, and uh, AB in R. So if I assume that R is unital, so if R is a ring with 1, then we have, if we take um, minus 1 times A, this is the same as A times minus 1. It's equal to minus A. Okay, so these are all things that uh, you certainly have seen, maybe even before you came to high school, but now we are talking about an arbitrary ring, not about uh, the integers. <coughs> so I just want to prove them. It's, it's all kind of obviously trivial, but it's some exercise uh, in playing with these axioms, like we did for groups. So. <coughs>
yeah, if I take a times zero, now zero is a neutral element for addition. So that's the same as if I do it twice. I add it, no, zero plus zero is zero. And by the distributive law, this is a times zero plus a times zero. Now, the addition is a, is a group, so we can you know, subtract a times zero from it on both sides. So it follows that zero is equal to a times zero. And obviously, uh, with the other one, you can imagine how to modify the proof. <coughs> and uh, for the second statement, it's quite similar. So we want to show, for instance, that if we take um, minus a times b, that this is uh, the additive inverse of a times b. So we have to see that if we add this to a plus b, we have to see we get 0. Now again, we can use the distributive law. So this is minus a plus a times b. And minus a plus a is 0. And so we find that this is the inverse of that. And uh, the other one is similar. Now, if you, the third one is just applying this twice. No? You do. Um, So we first uh, do it here. This is minus a times minus b. And this is minus minus a times b. And minus minus is just a b. And um, well, the fourth one is actually essentially just a special case. So yeah, so if I take minus 1 times a, this is according to what we said here. This is minus 1 times a. This is minus a. OK, so this is not very difficult. <coughs> so now we want to uh, introduce a couple of further properties that rings sometimes have. So one nice property that the integers have is that it does not happen that you have two elements which are non-zero and you multiply them and get zero. And so a, a ring which has this property, uh, say if it's a commutative ring, which has property, it's called an integral domain. So we can introduce this property and we will later mostly be interested in integral domains. So <coughs> definition. So R is a, see, we assume now we maybe just look at commutative rings. So let R be a commutative ring. So an element, say B, say A and R, and the element is not supposed to be the zero element, is called a zero divisor. Well, in some sense, if it's divisor of if it is divisor of zero, so that if you can multiply it with another element to get zero. So if there exists an element B in R, and this element should also be different from zero, such that A B is equal to zero. We know that this is something which cannot happen in the integers, for instance. And uh, a ring which does not have zero divisors is called, so a commutative ring with one without zero divisors is called an integral domain. Zero divisors. is called an integral domain.
So somehow it says it's very much like the integers. And you know, as we you know, it's obviously clear that z is an integral domain. So if we are in an integral domain, we can uh, cancel factors from products like we can in groups. Now as a, <coughs> I mean, trivially, um, so that means we have a, mark, so we have the cancellation property. So if we don't, well, we just have need that we have no zero device, but I say integral domain because uh, I don't worry about other cases. So let R be an integral domain. So if we have elements, if uh, we have A, B, C in R such that uh, AB is equal to AC, then such that then B is equal to C. So we can cancel common factors. Well, and this is uh, quite obvious. So we assume that AB is equal to AC. So we can bring this to the other side. So we have AB minus AC is equal to 0. This is the same as A times B minus C. So now A is non-zero. And we have a product of two elements so that we get 0. As we are in an integral domain, one of the two elements must be 0. And A is non-zero, so B minus C must be 0. Yeah, and so once I was actually, I, I failed to make the assumption that A is different from 0. No, such that A is different from 0. And uh, then B is equal to C. A B minus C is equal to 0. And thus B is equal to C. Mm -hmm. OK. So let's see what uh, the few rings that we have seen so far, which of them are integral domains and which are not. So we have seen that Z is an integral domain. Then um, if we look at. Um, uh, say z6, so integers modulo 6. This is not an integral domain. Because if we take the product of 2, now I, I write the usual multiplication, 2 times 3 in this, uh, in this ring is equal to what you do if you take 6 and take the rest uh, dividing by 6 of that, which is 0. So we find actually two non-zero elements whose product is 0. And um, on the other hand, so one could think that all these Zn's are not integral domains. But uh, so if p is a prime number, then uh, mm. um, then we can take. Um, so, 
So if I take any element, so if if n is different from zero, so so if p does not divide n and p does not divide m, then as p is a prime number, it also does not divide the product. So that means that if I have uh, elements n and m in z mod p, so thus if n is different from 0, also m in z mod p, in z p, then n times m is also different from 0 in z p. So we find that z p is an integral domain. Okay. So <clears throat> I had introduced these uh, so in a in a uh, in a group we have that every element has an inverse in a, in the additive group obviously you have always a negative of any element because it's a group but in the the multiplica multiplication does not form a group so we do not require that every element has an inverse but those elements which do have an in inverse we call the units units in R, so which is a ring with one, are elements with a multiplicative inverse. So that means, in other words, so an element, so the definition, so an element A in R is called a unit if there exists an element B in R such that A times B is equal to B times A is equal to 1. And so the set of units in R is denoted R star. And now the a tiny. Um, so it's easy to see as uh, in, um, in group theory that if an inverse exists, it is unique, and we denote the inverse then by b to the minus 1. So b will be unique, denote it a to the minus 1. Okay? You can check that it's unique. So for instance, as an example, what are the units in Z? So these are the elements which have a, an inverse for the multiplication. Well, so this is only 1 and minus 1. And uh, whatever, if we take the rational numbers, then the inverse, the invertible rational numbers are precisely the rational numbers minus the element 0. So every rational number which is not 0 is invertible. 
so in, in these cases, it's easy to see that this set together with the multiplication forms a group. No? 1 times 1 is equal to 1. 1 times minus 1 is equal to minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. And this indeed is always the case. The units form a group under multiplication. Well, it's almost table, but still, for some reason, I call it proposition. So let R be a ring with 1. Then R star with the multiplication is a group. And this group will be called the multiplicative group of R. This is essentially, again, trivial, maybe as a, another stupid exercise in the definition. We have to see what we have to check, proof. So we know that the multiplication is associate, uh, associative. So it's also associative if we restrict it to R star. Um, by definition, every element in R star has an inverse. So, so, so first we have the element 1 is in R star. So we have a neutral element. And for A in R star, we also have A to the minus 1 is in R star. So um, all the actions of a group are fulfilled except possibly that the product of two uh, elements lies in the group. So let uh, A and B be in R star to see AB is in R star. Well, and that's also not so very difficult because if we take AB times uh, B to the minus 1, A to the minus 1, well, then this will be A times B, B to the minus 1 to A, A to the minus 1 is equal to 1 and the same way. B to the minus 1, A to the minus 1, A, B is equal to 1. So we see that, the, that A, B is a unit if A and B are units. So A, B is a unit. And thus, we have seen that uh, the units form a group. And as I said, uh, this group is called the multiplicative group of R. So, <coughs> I uh, just remind you of the notation that I had introduced in the very beginning, so if, uh, if A is an element in R and N is in Z, we can uh, define N times A, which if, if N is bigger than 0 is A plus A plus A N times. And we can also define A to the N, which which be the multiplication. No, that's not. So this is if. Um, <coughs> So if, uh, say, so if n is positive, so anyway, we can define this. So if n is bigger equal to 0, say bigger than 0, or a is a unit, then we can also define a to the n, which if n is bigger than 0, is just a multiplied with itself n times. And otherwise, we have to take the inverse and then take it to the minus that power. So this we had introduced before. And uh, we have the usual rules um, that uh, I also mentioned the other time. So we have, uh, uh, we have for instance, that uh, n plus m 
times A is equal to N A plus M A and uh, N times M times A is equal to uh, N times M times A and also the same for the powers A to the N times A to the M is equal to A to the N plus M and A to the N to the power M is equal to A to the N times M. Okay, so this is these all these statements are very easy to prove by induction, and uh, I already mentioned them for groups before. Okay, so now how much time? Yeah, so now we want to come to somehow maybe for us the most important example of a ring, or in some sense of a construction of one ring from another, which is uh, the polynomial ring. So we want to, you know, if we are given a ring, we want to consider the ring of polynomials with coefficients in the first ring. So, I mean, from high school or university, you know about polynomials. So, um, you would say, you know, for instance, so, so in, in school, you have a, you have a polynomial is, uh, say, f equal to, so f of x you would say is equal to sum uh, i equals say, 0 to n a i x to the i, where say a i is a rational, is an integer, uh, is a real number, and you would view this f as a function from r to r, no? and uh, you uh, view it as function f from r to r. So to some element b, you send, you send b to f of b, which is sum i equals 0 to n a i b to the i. So <coughs> this is certainly a quite useful viewpoint, but we actually want to see the polynomials more formally. For us, a polynomial would just be a, you know, um, in some sense, a formula. So just these symbols, this thing, is the polynomial. I don't care about the function. Um, so, so we, for us, the polynomial will be a formal expression. So the polynomial is fixed by saying what these numbers a, i are. So let me give the definition, which is, strictly speaking, only 99% precise, but it's much simpler than. <coughs> OK, so definition. Let r be a ring. need the one I expect. So a polynomial f f with coefficients in R is the following expression. to say sum i equal 0 
to some number n, a0, x to the ai, x to the i, for some n bigger equal to 0, and ai are elements in R. But it's not quite the truth, because um, if um, two polynomials only, if these numbers n happen to be different, but at the end we just have some zeros, they still are the same polynomials. So let me write this down. So the two polynomials f and uh, g bj x to the j are equal and we will just write f is equal to g if uh, so we have these two numbers n and m we can assume that one of them is bigger than the other so assume maybe that m is bigger equal to n so if so assuming m is bigger equal to n um, we first have that um, uh, bj is equal to 0 for all j bigger than n so the extra terms that we have here all have coefficient 0 and uh, ai is equal to bj for uh, 0 smaller equal to i smaller equal to n so <coughs> So two coefficients are equal if uh, two polynomials are equal if these uh, numbers here are equal and uh, some extra zeros don't count. So if, if this, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, okay. So we denote uh, Rx. Uh, so actually, yeah, polynomial f, see, in the variable x with these coefficients. Denote Rx, uh, uh, the set of polynomials in x with coefficients in R. Um, so we can see, so there, um, so <coughs> the polynomial, uh, say, A0 equal to, uh, so A0 times x to the 0 is identified with the element A0 in R. So you could say we have a map from R to Rx, which sends A0 to A0 times X to 0. But anyway, with this, we can view R as a subset of Rx. So with this, we have that R is contained in Rx. Now the the ring R consists just of those polynomials, which have only, where or, you know, the only non-zero coefficient is A0. So these polynomials are called constant polynomials. So R time, so R in Rx, is the subset of constant polynomials. Okay. 
So I wanted to, um, you know, in the beginning I stressed uh, that um, for us polynomials are not functions, but they are these formal expressions. They are just such expressions with this identification. And they are not just viewed as functions from R to R. So, so the polynomial f I equals sum i equals 0 to n a i x to the i in i x is not the same as the function. which sends p, so, and which sends an element b in r, so, from r to r, which sends b to what one would call f of b, which is uh, sum i equals 0 to n a i b to the i. For instance, you know, one could look at an extreme case. So, for instance, if r is equal to z2. So r has only two elements. So the total number of functions from r to r is 4. Okay. Four functions uh, from r to r. No? That's all. But there are infinitely many polynomials with coefficients in R. You can just put any coefficient. Any set of finitely many numbers gives you a polynomial. And they are all different as polynomials. But infinitely many. But there are infinitely many polynomials in Rx. Okay. Um, how much? Okay, still ten minutes. So now, uh, in a moment, I've just introduced them as a set. These polynomials. Now I have to define the ring structure, obviously. So we want the polynomials to form a ring, and so we have to define what the addition and the multiplication of polynomials is definition. So we define a ring structure on Rx. So we have to say how we want, want to add and to multiply polynomials. So, so if we have um, f of sum i equals 1, 0 to n, a n, uh, x to the n, and g i equal So we can assume that this number is the same because we can always add uh, you know, 0 times x to the i for the larger ones because it's the same element. So for this, we can define the sum. So we define f plus g to be you know, how you learn to add polynomials in school. Namely, this is sum i equals 0 to n. A i plus B i x to the i. Okay, so you just add these coefficients. Um, I should maybe say that um, A i will be called the, called the coefficient of x to the i in F. No? And um, for the multiplication, it's a bit more complicated. You know, it's, uh, you just write down the formula that you get if you do what you learn in school. 
how you multiply it out by using the distributive law. So this would be the sum of all k, say in this case from 0 to 2n. Take the sum over all numbers i and j such that i plus j is equal to k. A i e j x to the k. So this uh, looks a bit more complicated, but it's just what you are used to. Namely, here this means, uh, in other words, um, we have that if I take a times x to the i times b times x to the j, this is defined to be a times b times x to the i plus j. And then you formally apply the distributive law to this sum. And then this will give you this formula. And uh, with these definitions, one can check that we get a ring. So clearly, we have that the element 0 in R, which is the constant polynomial 0, so all the coefficients are 0, is the neutral element for the addition. And um, we get, uh, so you can check uh, x is the ring. So if, um, if r is commutative, then also x is commutative. That's uh, obvious if you look at the definition here. No, it's just uh, you just switch them and get the other definition. And if um, R is a ring with one, then R X is also a ring with one. And the unit element will be just the same. It is just the constant polynomial 1. You know, so if you look at the definition here, if just one of them is 1, you just get back the original polynomial. You know, if you if you say f is equal to 1, you know, in this multiplication, you just will get back g. And uh, we also see R is a subring of Rx. So if we look at the multiplication in Rx and restrict it to constant polynomials, it's just the, the multiplication in R. No? If you look at this definition, then all this hocus pocus blow, uh, blow, you know, vanishes just the sum from k to, from 0 to 0. Uh, you know, you know, and if this is f is equal to a, g is equal to b, this is just a times b. So there's nothing going on. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so we also want to maybe use. Um, Uh, some you know kind of simplified notation so if say we have um, zero times x to the zero plus uh, two times x to the one plus three times x to the two plus 
uh, 0 times x to the 3 plus x to the 4, 1 times this. So we would just write this, write only the terms which matter. So we write this as, in this, you know, as you would do in school, as 2x plus 3x squared plus x to the 4. Just we don't we we don't need to keep the terms with zero, and we don't need to keep the one. Okay, now we are still two minutes, so we maybe. Um, so the final. I mean, we can just state it. Um, so finally, if the ring R is an integral domain, then also Rx will be an integral domain. And the units of Rx will just be the units of R viewed as constant polynomials. So first, I introduce the degree of a polynomial definition. Maybe I stop there. Let um, f equal to sum i equal zero to n a i x to the i be a polynomial, and we can always, you know, do it in such a way that the highest for the highest for that the a n is non-zero. Because if we have any further zeros, we can forget them. So with a n different from 0, then the degree of f is, uh, so it's denoted, the degree of f is equal to this number n. So it's the kind of, if it's a coefficient, so uh, it's the, the highest power for which the coefficient is non-zero. And uh, we call a n the leading coefficient. of f, so the coefficient uh, of the highest power, which is non-zero. And so I wanted to say, so remark. So assume R is an integral domain. And we take two non-zero elements in R, in, so two non-zero polynomials. So they are not equal to the constant polynomial 0. Then first, f times g will be non-zero. And in fact, the degree of f times g is equal to the sum of the degrees of f and g. And uh, the second statement is that Rx is an integral domain. OK, this is kind of trivial because uh, we have just said if f and g are two non-zero elements, then the product is non-zero. So that means it's an integral domain. So this is uh, just a reformulation of part of 1. And the, what is the third statement is that if I take the units of Ix, this is the same as the units of R. So that means. A polynomial can be unit for the multiplication only if it's a constant polynomial. So it has only terms of degree 0. And these are a unit. OK, so this is all very simple. And then I stop. So we can write f. So we are doing 1. We can write f as sum i equals 0 to n a i 
x to the i with a n different from 0, and g sum j equals 0 to m, b j x to the j with b m different from 0. So I have, you know, so that means the degree of f is equal to n and the degree of g is equal to m. And um, so we had this formula that f times g was uh, some i equals 0 to n, uh, say ci x to the i, so k, ck uh, x to the k, where ck was equal to the sum i plus j is equal to k ai bj. Yeah, OK. Now, so we don't, so the, the highest possible thing that occurs is n plus m. But if you look at the case n plus m, the only possibility if, uh, that i plus j is equal to n plus m is that i is equal to n and j is equal to m. And then we get, therefore, that c n plus m is equal by this formula to a n times b m. OK? So it follows, and this is non-zero, because uh, you know, these were both, both non-zero, and this was an integral domain. So therefore, we find thus f times g is indeed different from 0, and the degree of f plus g is n plus m, which is equal to the degree of f plus the degree of g. And then uh, finally, we can do this. Uh, how much? Well, it's OK. Um, <coughs> you can do this thing with the units. So if, uh, say, A in R is a unit, then it will be a unit. in Rx, because you can always just multiply with the inverse in, uh, you know, in R. And this will, you know, if you multiply a polynomial, uh, <coughs> and you will get back uh, the element 1. You know? So there's no problem with that. We have to see that these are all the units. So let f be unit in Rx. So it's actually like this. So then, by definition, this means there exists an element g, a polynomial g, such that f times g is equal to the constant polynomial 1. So the constant polynomial 1 has degree 0. And we have seen that the degrees add up. So the degree of f plus g, of f times g, which is the degree of the polynomial 1, and this is 0, is equal to the degree of f plus the degree of g. So it follows that both the degree of f and the degree of g is equal to 0. But you know, a polynomial of degree 0 is just an element of R. And they are still inverse to each other, so F is a unit. OK, so maybe that's enough for now. I'm sorry I went slightly over time, but uh, sometimes also finished earlier. OK, we see each other next week after this holiday. Any question? <laughs>